If we backpack on the Appalachian Trail, the Pacific Crest Trail, or the Continental Divide Trail, do we need to carry paper maps? I know firsthand that many AT hikers don't carry them, except maybe for the town maps and trail guides like the one published by David Miller. I wouldn't be surprised if many PCT hikers don't carry them. As near as I can tell from looking at the AT Conservancy website, the ATC has 51 paper maps that cover the entire AT. That's a lot of maps, and a quick moving hiker might cover one of those maps in two days. Using one or more smartphone apps is the routine in 2016, but some people tell us it can be unsafe to rely on electronics and nothing else. Among the links in the description is one about a study in California of people spending at least one night in a wilderness area. The study found most of those with a cell phone, GPS, or similar communication device admitted to having done something in the wilderness they considered unsafe at the time. The study linked those devices with an increased willingness to take risks. Also in the description is a link to a PCT Association page that flatly says maps are, quote, essential for anyone who hikes the trail, and it tells where to find such maps. Another link is to the sectionhiker.com website that advocates carrying the kind of waterproof maps sold by the ATC. So far, I have always carried maps on AT section hikes. Leaving aside those long triple crown trails, the United States has many shorter trails with maps available on trail websites. At some trails, we can pick up a map at the trailhead. And if we wander across wide wilderness areas with no defined trails, we could be playing with fire if we don't have a topographical map and the ability to use it. So we're going to talk about using a map and compass with an emphasis on ways people get confused when trying to use a map and ways to prevent that confusion. Later, I will give my advice for those who want a more detailed look at the subject. First, the compass. Probably the most basic rudimentary use of a compass is the way I use one on the Appalachian Trail. If I step off the trail to look for a stealth camping spot, which I've done a lot, I first look at a compass. If, for example, I'm going northwest to enter the woods, that tells me I have to go southeast to get back on the trail. Statistically speaking, it is a rare event if an AT hiker steps off the trail and can't find their way back to it, but it's not impossible. And if it does happen, it can be a very serious problem. In another video, I told how I got lost in Canada because I went into a huge woods without a compass. After that scare, I vowed I would never step between two trees again without first looking at my compass. Some backpackers will tell us they have hiked the wrong direction on the AT, for example, heading south by mistake when on a northbound hike. The only thing that has prevented that kind of thing from happening to me was carrying a compass and looking at it. When hiking northbound, I know I'm going the right direction when the compass shows the trail going somewhere between west by northwest and east by northeast. I have a number of compasses, and in my experience, a liquid-filled compass is almost certain to be accurate. Even so, Every time I buy a compass, I have another compass in my pocket. I check to make sure the one I'm about to buy agrees with my old one. This can be done if we hold one compass at least six or so inches above the other. If we hold them side by side, they will throw each other off. Most compasses, at least an inch across, have markings showing the 360 degrees of a circle. Each degree is a specific direction. For example, 90 degrees is dead east, 180 degrees is dead south, etc. Opposite directions are 180 degrees apart, which is half of the 360 degree circle. For example, dead west is 270 degrees and dead east is 90 degrees. Dead west is called the back azimuth of 90 degrees and vice versa. This is the typical system for civilian navigation. Identifying direction with these numbers can add some precision to the process. Some compasses, like these two, have features designed to improve accuracy when using map and compass together. We should expect compasses like these to come with instructions on how to use those different features. From a practical standpoint, many people traveling on foot have navigated successfully with a basic compass showing only 10 degree increments. Next, maps. Perhaps the most fundamental skill is the ability to use a road map. I say this because if we cannot read a road map, a topographical map is bound to give us even more trouble. And I have seen that not everyone can read a road map. 
I once went on a trip with a guy. We were going east on an interstate highway. We had to go north at another interstate in front of us. My passenger insisted that when we hit the interstate, we had to make a right turn. People have had this kind of problem since maps were invented. In the Battle of Shiloh in the American Civil War, a Union general marched thousands of his men behind enemy lines because he got the direction wrong. The problem might be that we tend to look at maps upright and in that position north is always at the top, but we're not always going north. So the map is not an immediately intuitive image of what's directly in front of us. I once had a talk with a former soldier who told me about the small unit navigation exercises he participated in. I said, let me guess, you guys got in arguments about which direction you were supposed to be going. And he said, oh yeah, all the time. We need to know three things. Where is north? Which direction are we moving in? Which general direction we want to be moving in? If we know these things and visualize our path on the map, it will help us turn in the correct direction. We cannot use a map effectively unless we get this basic concept nailed down. I once took a course in land navigation with Map and Compass. A course like that is an extremely good idea, especially when the instructors take us outside and challenge us to solve navigation problems with a compass. That can be an eye-opening experience. If a club or store near you offers such a course, my advice is sign up for it. The course I took was designed for hikers and backpackers and it emphasized a valuable point. Many elements of traditional navigation are designed for complex tasks like steering ships across an ocean or flying airplanes or completing complex military tasks like calling in artillery. Such navigation can require things like protractors and mathematical calculations. When we read about such navigation, we are tempted to think using map and compass can be a virtually flawless and precise process. But that course instructor emphasized if we are on foot, the train itself can present obstacles that increase navigational difficulty. Things like 10-foot cliffs, large marshy areas we cannot walk through, and dense undergrowth we have to bypass are rarely shown on topographical maps. When we went outside to solve compass problems, those problems confronted us with difficulty caused by the terrain. It was later explained to us a goal of the exercise was to prevent us from doing nothing except looking at the compass in our hand. We were searching for signs hanging on trees. Unless we were looking for those signs, we were unlikely to find them. Many of these same points are repeated by this Army Navigation Handbook. There are expedients we can use to help us navigate difficult terrain, and we will discuss some of them in a minute. Next are topographical maps. In particular, they are designed to help us move over undeveloped landscape. I would say I have used topographical maps successfully since I was a teenager. And in my view, there has been one big reason for that success. It's because almost every minute, I knew where my general position was on the map. I looked at the map closely before I start a trip. I want to identify features I will encounter along the route. I want to know what is on my left and what is on my right. I often pause and look at the map to keep track of what's happening. If by comparison, I kept the map buried in my pack until I got lost or confused, I would then face an uphill battle trying to end that confusion, and it might be a very difficult uphill battle. Topographical maps, for those who don't know, have contour lines that show different elevations. Contour lines are a three-dimensional representation of the terrain as viewed from above. If the lines are very close together, that represents a very steep terrain compared to lines with a lot of space between them. These lines tell us where hills and gullies are, for example. There's not a lot of writing on topographical maps, so it helps to rotate the map so it aligns with our compass. We also need to be aware of declination. If you have never heard of declination, you can hit pause and read this. This is essentially the method of declination we were taught in that course for foot travel. Our next topic is the one most heavily emphasized in most map and compass instruction, and that is how to identify on the map and then follow a specific direction. This specific direction is usually called a heading, bearing, or azimuth, which all refer to the same basic concept. The basic procedure is relatively simple. We identify our location on a map, point A, and the location we want to reach, point B. The next goal is to use the compass to look in the exact direction of the bearing and note some distant landmark feature in the same direction. 
then we walk toward that feature. While it's not absolutely necessary, if we have a pencil and straight edge and can draw the bearing on the map, there's no harm to doing it. What if we don't see any convenient distant landmark? Now we come to those expedients listed in the Army Manual. One of the most valuable is what the book calls a long linear feature. This could be a road, a railroad, a river, or a power line. When I got lost in Canada, knowing that a power line was to the west literally saved my neck. If we see long linear features on the map, we can note their position relative to our bearing and goal. One such feature might let us know if we wander too far to the left or right, or if we walk past our objective. It can help a lot if our objective is on or near a long linear feature running at right angles to our path. If this happens, the manual suggests walking to the right by 10 or so degrees. This would allow us to turn to our left when we hit the long feature and walk until we hit the objective. The value of this technique is that it will reduce the odds we might accidentally walk past the objective. If a long feature is basically parallel to our heading, the manual calls it a handrail. Following a handrail can keep us going in the right direction, particularly in a dense woods with no distant landmarks visible. But we have to be on our toes and watch for it if the map shows the handrail will make a turn away from our bearing. If we have no clear landmarks in the distance, we can follow the bearing and be on the lookout for what the manual calls steering marks. This will be a landscape feature we can't see until we start following the bearing. A steering mark could be a distinctive tree, rock, or hill in our path. We check our compass to see where the steering mark is in relation to our bearing. This would tell us if we should walk directly toward the steering mark or to the left or right. If no good steering marks appear in front of us, we can look directly behind us and might find one we can visually keep track of as we walk. We can also check its position with a compass. Again, if that mark is in the complete opposite direction of our heading, it's called a back azimuth. One traditional aid in finding our objective is knowing the distance to be traveled and determining how much time it will take to get there. This will work only if we move at a constant speed and know what that speed is. If we're bushwhacking on foot in rough terrain, my instructor in that course told us maintaining a reliable and constant speed will be just about impossible over a long distance. In theory, the compass and map can also tell us exactly where we are. This chart shows us how to do it. The problem will be spotting two identifiable landmarks. There might not be any in flat, heavily wooded terrain. In some areas, we will be surrounded by mountains or tall hills that will all be about the same height. Even with a topographical map, it might be a struggle to tell one from the other. The best plan, like I said, is to be as sure as we can about our general location at all times. The techniques I have described here are the ones that have allowed me to successfully use topographical maps since I was a teenager. Again, I urge everyone to take a map and compass course if you can find one. And if we want to be a navigational virtuoso, books like this can help. The description contains six links, including where to buy U.S. Geological Survey maps. So please take a look. And now, finally, we are once again done. As always, my thanks goes out to all my subscribers. If you have not subscribed, please consider it. And thanks a million for watching.